just want to check this mic to be sure that you can hear me. Can everyone hear me? Okay, that's great. Um, here's how we are organizing ourselves this morning, and we're delighted to be here with you. And that is uh, that each of us will um, uh, talk for a few minutes um, about uh, our comments on and thoughts and views on our topic. Uh, we will then uh, talk about this uh, uh, within our own uh, panel and then open it up to you uh, for questions and comments as well. And um, I promised Mark that we would uh, wind up uh, at about uh, 60 minutes later. So we have a lot to talk about uh, with you and looking forward to it. <clears throat> I uh, uh, first visited uh, Beirut, Lebanon, where Saving the Next Generation is based, uh, about 40 years ago. And uh, I remember being so impressed uh, with Lebanon and Beirut in particular because uh, uh, the community there had experienced harmonious relationships within itself uh, for centuries, and uh, it was um, considered the Switzerland of the Middle East, uh, many such designations uh, reflecting on the stability and uh, the harmony uh, that uh, the residents enjoyed. Um, as we all know, um, uh, this became disrupted through civil wars, um, external uh, influences, now more than a million uh, refugees from Syria. Are in it. So this is a very difficult situation. The Hezbollah, uh, an extremist group, uh, uh, very um, uh, prevailing in terms of its power uh, in Lebanon and in the region. And um, so very uh, courageously, a um, uh, Shiite couple uh, uh, decided to uh, foster um, a, an approach toward uh, providing a counterbalance uh, to the extremists in the form of um, uh, providing educational opportunities and exposure uh, to uh, human values uh, that um, had somehow escaped um, uh, children, students in the southern district of Beirut in particular, uh, dominated by the extremists, where kids go to school and they learn how to hate non-believers. So the, the idea here is that uh, if you can capture uh, children at a young enough point before they are subject to this, you might call it brainwashing, uh, that you have a, a, a real good chance to um, capture their attention and to imbue in them human values, which uh, should um, ultimately overtake um, the current mentality and uh, emphasize uh, to the new leadership, the next generation of leadership, um, the importance of um, recognizing the values that people, regardless of their religion, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their ethnicity, bring to um, a forward-looking uh, progressive culture. Um, so saving the next generation, which is just a few years old, um, um, started by building a camp up in the mountains overlooking Beirut, establishing um, an opportunity for uh, now 1,500 uh, students starting at age 10 up through age uh, uh, early 20s uh, to become introduced uh, to the values of, of, of uh, humanity and um, to become exposed to other parts of Lebanon and other parts of the world in terms of, of the opportunities that are there. Uh, uh, not only these kids uh, have the advantage of this fantastic campsite, uh, which has both recreational and educational features, uh, but um, 300 of them uh, are fully uh, supported financially in going to one of four leading Lebanese universities. And um, five of them have come to this country, the, uh, uh, the Al-Assad's, the name of the family, uh, believe strongly in the uh, freedoms that we enjoy in the United States and wanted to expose their, uh, these students uh, here as well, and to, an, edu to uh, an educational experience at the higher education level. And um, uh, as Mark pointed out, one of our panelists um, is in that situation, having uh, uh, been raised in Lebanon and coming here and being exposed to um, uh, freedom uh, and an open educational process. So those are, those are my comments, um, and let me turn to Nancy Kale. Thank you, everybody. We're all delighted to be here. Um, let me just talk a little bit about the organization uh, and how we got started in the United States um, to uh, grow and scale this endeavor that was started by um, 
Ahmad and Arbi or El Assad. As Marv mentioned, um, there are three programs related to Saving the Next Generation. We have a camp in the mountains for 10 to um, high school uh, age children. Uh, 1,500 kids, Sunni, Shia, Christians are coming together for the first time ever, the first time that they're leaving their small villages and learning, um, you know, that they're all pretty much the same. They have the same values, the same wants, uh, the same dreams, and um, they've been taught differently, let's say, in their villages. So this doesn't sound so different in the United States context, but it definitely is in a Lebanon context. Uh, then, as Marv mentioned, there's a university program in Lebanon where 300 students who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to attend private university in Lebanon are getting the opportunity to do that. And then there's a program in the United States, a little bit more expensive, but definitely worth it, to bring students like Mustafa, and he'll speak in a couple minutes, to the United States uh, to understand what it's like to be here and to get a university education in the United States. And then the idea is to go back to Lebanon. Um, most of the students that we're bringing here and the students, the university students in Lebanon are entering um, careers um, that are very, uh, that will make them very employable uh, when they graduate. So it, they're tending to be in the sciences um, or business related um, types of curricula in uh, both university settings. So um, this wonderful couple had started this organization uh, because they saw, as opposed to when they were growing up in Lebanon, um, that the society was becoming very fractured and very intolerant. And they set about to change that and to give youth an opportunity um, to um, be tolerant of one another and um, through education and economic opportunity, um, build a better Lebanon and reverse some of the destructive changes they saw taking place in their country. Um, so they've created this uh, wonderful organization and they needed to scale it. So a couple years ago, um, they um, came to the United States to set up an organization that would um, provide the resources to grow this organization and um, realize their, their mission. Uh, so we set about um, developing a board that was as diverse as the students who we were supporting in Lebanon, um, Jews, Christians, Lebanese, other Arabs uh, were coming together from a governance standpoint. And then we, decided to, then we started to um, grow a marketing and communications effort and a development effort to spread the word um, about saving the next generation in the United States. And we also started to focus on some of the US-based programs and really helping the students who are coming here um, really not having left their small area within Lebanon, um, let alone their country, um, until they participate in a saving the next generation program. So uh, that was ex exciting for all of us to uh, get to interact and, and work with um, amazing students like Mustafa. So along the way, there have been um, lots of challenges and in interesting developments. Uh, working certainly with the Lebanese diaspora community in the United States has been very interesting for all of us. And um, ha helping um, Ahmad and Abir al-Assad, who um, have their own challenges um, w working within Lebanon to, um, to grow their organization. Uh, so I think I'll leave it at that because I want to uh, give you a chance to hear from one of the students themselves and then uh, another board member who has um, affiliations with other similar organizations in the United States that I think will prove interesting to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, so good morning. Um, so the, I'll be telling you the story of, of how I met the SNG and um, how grateful I am to be here with, with you and how grateful I am to be um, at the United States um, doing my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Um, so I grew up in a, in a small village in, Le in South Lebanon, mainly Shia. Um, so after finishing high school, I was like, okay, then what? What, what can I do with that? It's I, like... 
it's so hard to get into college after high school in Lebanon. And um, I met SNG through a family friend, and um, it was a great opportunity. So mainly, um, when you're at this age in Lebanon, you won't have and you don't have an opportunity to go to college and like continue your higher education, um, extremists will, will approach you. They will be like, okay, we'll give you money, come fight, with, come fight with us, follow us, do this, do that. But actually, like, um, I met SNG and um, they helped me out through, through this by giving me an opportunity to come and study mechanical engineering at the United States. And um, Describe some of your roommates and your first experiences when you got here, how different oh, it was. Oh, yeah. Actually, um, when I came here, I saw like how, the, how the, and when I saw how diverse my, my college was, I met a lot of people from all over the world, met so many cultures, um, actually, like, I got, like, more open-minded. I, I, now I know, like, people from Fiji, for example. Um, like, I didn't, I didn't expect that. Like, and, um, you'll know, I know, like, a lot of people from different countries. Um, I got exposed to more religions, more cultures, and, um, I think that what, that's what the Middle East wants, like, to be open-minded, um, stop thinking about, like, oh, about religions and, like, you're from a different culture, so you're different. Um, we should, like, get over this in order to eliminate extremism and um, all, all you need is just, like, to be open-minded in order to, like, to get over uh, extremism. And, um, what else? Let's go. We'll, we'll come back you, to uh, we'll come I, back I, to I, I just have one we'll question for you. How is it like when you go back now? You said you were just back in December, right? Oh, so like, I went to, um, for Christmas to Lebanon, and um, I, I saw that, like, the country is dead. Like, all the young people won't, won't get employed. There's a lot of unemployment. Um, people are trying, like, any way, like all the ways to get money to build up their future. Um, and as I said before, that that's when extremism, extremists and terrorists like approach you. They will give you like money. Oh, come fight with us. Oh, we're building your future. Like they brainwash you to like follow them. Oh, we're we're like we're the best for you now, but I think all 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 what Lebanon needs is, is education right now, and um, I'll ask my phone. <laughs> Thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Rich. <coughs> Hi, my name is Richard Adler, and again, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I'm a member of the board, and. Uh, was uh, drawn to uh, Saving Next Generation from a personal relationship with Mark Berenbloom. But I think I did bring a little different perspective. I, I have a background professionally in international finance and was mindful of the fact that Beirut was the banking center, the Switzerland of um, uh, the Middle East, uh, uh, you know, 30 and 40 years ago. And to see the um, impact of the conflicts there uh, on, and, and how it's affected their business culture as well as their uh, uh, social structure. I, and I'm a, a, a firm believer in the notion of, of social entrepreneurship. Uh, one of the uh, lessons of the business world is accountability uh, and resource utilization. And what's often been the case in uh, uh, the private sector or, or social uh, and, and, uh, and excuse me, in social in initiatives, this is difficult. You don't have an organizing metric of uh, what is it we're trying to do. Profit uh, it, it is, is an organizing principle uh, and, and many disciplines follow from that. So 
the goal is outcomes. What are we doing to achieve the outcomes? And what I was so admiring of in uh, seeing the initiative of the, uh, uh, the uh, two uh, organizers, the Al-Assad family, because they are successful business people, bringing this focus uh, with defined outcomes uh, and, and goals in mind and developing the means to achieve them. And uh, you have in Mustafa Exhibit A because they're, the pinnacle of their program is to bring students uh, to the United States where their own background in education told them there was this dynamic cross-cultural um, uh, 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 character of the U.S., which they had seen was, was had was not occurring at this point in Lebanon in an attempt to restore it. Uh, there, in addition to that, there are, what, 300 students now in, in, um, at, at universities in Lebanon, and then they have the program for younger students where they're t sending them from different villages from around the country uh, at a younger age, starting at age 10, uh, up to the mountains, and, and getting to know each other as people. Uh, in the end, this cross-cultural work is, creates what I call global citizens. I happen to be on the board also of a similar uh, uh, but older organization, World Learning, uh, based in Brattleboro in Washington, which does uh, uh, study abroad uh, programs all over the world. It goes all the way back to the, actually the, the basis where uh, the Peace Corps was established back in the 50s. And it, or, it, it, the first programs actually were in Germany, since we're here with a, a German-sponsored group. Um, and it uh, has uh, uh, running not just uh, educational programs from high school through uh, graduate schools, but also uh, major uh, uh, exchange programs, uh, bringing students in and, and teaching things like we're teaching 90,000 teachers for, for uh, English as a second language in Pakistan. We're teaching STEM uh, programs uh, for you know, young women in, in Egypt. Uh, in fact, the largest programs that we have are four different major programs in Lebanon, including working with the Syrian um, refugee population now, uh, in many cases together with, with uh, sponsorship from USAID. But the point is, it is this cross-cultural experience where people come to see each other as people and, and, and understand their commonalities and not their differences is determinative. And I can tell you that in business, this ability to work cross-culturally is key and will be even more so, at least I hope so, in the future. I mean, there are real threats out there right now where in many countries, in many cultures, are beginning to turn inward. And, and so these initiatives, both SNG and, and, and others, are these, these uh, efforts to sustain what has been this cross-cultural uh, exchange, which I think is the basis of world peace, and it could be threatened. So it's very important work that, that's, there being, that's being done. Thanks, Rich. Uh, I think one of the uh, themes that underlies what we're talking about is the concept of hopeless, hopelessness, uh, that um, if young people don't have any hope for the future, they have, they're deprived of any aspirations, they become very vulnerable, they become at risk. And so that's why we'd like to get to these kids as early as we can um, and talk and open, their, uh, open them to ex uh, experiences that they couldn't even imagine that they would ever have and, and that they would have an opportunity because that's the second part of the theme, not only addressing hopelessness but giving opportunity to kids who could thrive given the opportunity. Uh, what, uh, what we're seeing here in Mustafa, you're seeing it, um, uh, and I remember Mustafa, when he first came here, he said, Marv, I, I just didn't think that this existed. They'd been talking to me about uh, uh, this evil empire, and uh, all of a sudden I see that uh, people love being here and they're thriving and uh, they're enjoying meeting people of different backgrounds with different viewpoints. Um, and I got excited myself when I saw that. I, I'm very involved with something called the Anti-Defamation League here in this country, and and um, this organization in this, in parallels in many respects saving the next generation in that um, it's, it's geared toward fighting prejudice. It's geared toward building mutual understanding um, among, uh, and we are a country now of minorities here, as you're probably aware, there are no majorities any longer. There. There's no majority. And so it's very it's imperative that we find a way and, uh, and I think we prided ourselves in our past history of being able to assimilate and, and um, find ways uh, to understand each other and to come together as a, one nation. 
And of course, that's the challenge in, in a country like Lebanon. Um, the other part of um, what Saving the Next Generation is attempting to do is to provide the, not only the understanding, but the skills that uh, the future leaders of a country like Lebanon will need in order to thrive. And so uh, you're seeing with Mustafa that he's studying mechanical engineering. Uh, so we are looking at STEM uh, type curricula here in this country as the primary focus uh, so that they can be prepared to uh, take on the opportunities that in fact exist where there's a, uh, a paucity of, of this kind of talent and educational background. So we're very excited about this and um, uh, what I'd like to do now is just turn to the panel and then we're going to rely on you uh, for some challenging questions that we can, or comments for that matter, that we can respond to. Any other comments? I just want to make a comment that it's been interesting to me to see uh, Mustafa's ev evolution because I met him a couple of years ago and um, he, uh, I think it's, in some ways he takes for granted all that he's taken in but I can remember times when he was saying, I met somebody who's Spanish speaking and in, in Lebanon, you know, you walk down the street and the first question that people ask you is what's your religion and here people that doesn't even occur to them. And, you know, he's met a Jewish person for the first time. And if you know that something about the history of Lebanon and Mustafa's from the South, that, you know, kind of tense between Lebanon and Israel. But um, it's really, you know, this type of exposure and then being able to study here for four years, engineering, it's just, it's like the American Express commercial. It's, you, you can't place a value on it. Um, I also want to make a point about how these programs are set up. All these students are going back. They only have four-year visas, so they're here to study, and then they go back to Lebanon. Uh, so uh, to Mark's point about um, educating and opening um, these students' eyes, um, it's with the uh, purpose of building um, the next generation of leaders. I would just uh, comment, on, and I'll turn to you, Mustafa. Um, what also has been exciting is to see the, respect, the receptivity on the part of Americans uh, to what is going on in Lebanon and this initiative. There's been a tremendous amount of support uh, for it, a uh, tremendous amount of interest, a tremendous amount of involvement, and it's encouraging because uh, uh, we, we, in this country, have, have uh, our naysayers, uh, people who think that um, um, we should be focusing on the United States and not worrying about the rest of the world, but um, uh, there are so many, um, uh, I think the vast majority of Americans that feel that um, we, can be, we can provide uh, constructive influence, um, uh, particularly with uh, the initiatives that are being taken locally, as the al Assads have done. If we can support that, that's absolutely the best way to achieve the kind of understanding that we all seek. And I, I know that you're all here because uh, this is your theme, is to try to find ways to uh, enhance uh, cross-cultural understanding. Mustafa. Actually, I wanted to make a funny comment about like um, people asking about your religion. So how, that's how it goes. Um, so the person will approach you, and um, he wants to know your religion. But he wants to ask you indirectly. So first he starts, he starts with your name. So if, if your name doesn't like tell him what religion you are, he'll, oh, what's your family name? And then we move on to, oh, what's your father's name? Like that's, that's how bad they want to know like what your religion is. And um, <laughs> yeah, that's it. So let's, um, let's invite uh, some questions or comments uh, from, from you all. Um, you may just want to make a comment or you may want to ask a question, but we invite you to do that. Yes? Please introduce yourselves too, so we all know who your name and where you're from. Matthew Black Eagle Man, uh, Dakota, Dakota Sioux from Long Plain First Nation Indian Reserve, Manitoba, Canada. My question is towards the camp uh, that you guys have for the youth, and uh, as I'll be presenting later on and talk about some of the work that we do, but how many cultures are represented in your camp that you're presenting to the children that you, that you work with? 
So the camp is, is based like almost like in the mountain and like almost in middle in the middle of Lebanon. So and if you if you know about Lebanon, there's around 17 religions like in a 10,000 kilometers squared. So <laughs> like that's how um, how much like th there's a lot of religions. So when I went there, I met like around like at least five other like people like five people from different religions like that's at least so it might like yeah it might differ from from time to time and um yeah so it's, it's very village based in in lebanon tribal and religious so you have and it's non-discriminatory so the camp um, is free, and they'll take in kids from all across the country. Yes. Hi, I'm Philip from Northern Ireland. And I had, there were just so many parallels there with my own situation, especially when Mustafa was saying there about, you know, one of the questions we get asked, where did you go to school? Which school did you go to? That, or if you wear a certain uniform for school, people know what your religious background is. Uh, is. Um, and I just wanted to ask, um, have you tried to disseminate your good practice to other post-conflict societies? Because um, in, in the situation back home where I'm from, the government have just recently released a, a huge strategy for improving intercultural dialogue between the two former competing sides in the conflict. And they've written into the strategy specifically setting up peace camps for young people. However, there's a great deal of scepticism on the ground as to how this will actually be achieved. And government, when we ask at conferences, how will you organize this? What, how will you get over the logistics? They seem to not have the answers. But it, it appears that people like you guys have a lot of the answers. And I just wanted to know, do you disseminate that to not just Northern Ireland, obviously, but other post-conflict societies as well? Go ahead, Nancy. So, so included in the growth plan was uh, scaling not just within Lebanon, but um, over a much longer term uh, basis uh, throughout the Middle East. And um, so, yes, that's the plan. And of course, it takes resources. So we think we have a good model. Um, one of the initiatives we undertook to make small, big, more quickly was partnering with organizations um, that are already doing this, that have that are um, have a, a long-standing um, reputation for doing this type of thing. Because um, SNG is novel in Lebanon, um, but this type of thing, of course, exists elsewhere. It exists in Ireland, and um, Rich actually is on the board of an organization that's been doing this for a long time. So that's exactly where we went. We went and we and we um, started a project with um, World Learning, and um, that that was interesting. It presented some challenges, but um, that's the way that we thought we could um, scale on a more um, expedited time frame, which is partnering with other organizations. So. Um, but it's um, it's a matter of resources. It's a matter of scale. So so thank you, and and also good good luck to you. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Let me just answer that, and that is, I think, you know, and I, I I've done some work in, uh, in in Ireland, and was always struck by, you know, this is one island. Why are there two uh, competing cultures? I and mean, this isn't, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's another version, as you said. But the one thing I would point out is that there are a, 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 a rather robust uh, number of uh, organizations of uh, you know uh, study abroad and uh, exchange programs that exist uh, again very often in the you know private sector privately funded and and I would uh, encourage if the government's setting up a program to use those resources I mean. You don't have to reinvent a wheel. You just need to know what wheels are out there. And you, whether you engage with them directly or you use their ex ex example, even some of their personnel, uh, to uh, help organize these programs, you can get there much faster. And I think that's, uh, uh, again, I think sometimes the, the public and the private sector don't communicate very well. And, and or the, uh, you know, the, the civil society, the third leg of the stool, which is pretty robust in this country, uh, perhaps less so in other countries where maybe it's uh, the social services or what have you are more based on the you know the religious infrastructure, which I think is more the case, for example, in, in Europe than it may be here. But 
I'm just saying there are examples out there that can be utilized either directly or by example uh, to expedite these uh, important initiatives. I might say also that um, part of the goal of the Al-Assad's is to go beyond Lebanon. Um, uh, Jordan, for example, would be a, an obvious next step. Um, uh, and there are other countries in the Middle East, uh, but, but with a focus particularly on the Middle East where, as you know, the, that's a critical source of, uh, of instability and, and, um, and extremism uh, today. And so, uh, whereas many organizations uh, are attempting to combat this extremism um, directly uh, uh, in terms of uh, force, um, this is a long-term strategy. It's not something where you see immediate results, uh, but um, over time, and we're already seeing it, um, it can be extraordinary. I think that if you take a long-term view, uh, this, this actually is a more effective way of combating extremism than uh, through force, uh, which only sometimes uh, incurs a uh, equivalent reaction, and all of a sudden you, you see strife beyond what it is that you want to uh, uh, to see. Uh, Nancy, I'm sorry, you had some comments? Yeah, I, I was just going to say strategically we're all grappling with the same things mm -hmm. because you, we, have, we don't have infinite resources. So uh, to realize your mission of eliminating extremism and fostering peace through education and opportunity, do you, for, you know, um, what it costs to send Mustafa to school here, um, we could send, you know, 50 to 100 kids to university um, so that they're employable in Lebanon. What they're not getting, though, is exposure um, to the United States. So it's, you know, it's all filled with trade-offs, so we've gone back and forth. So you know, do you want to um, educate a lot of kids for a couple months and give them that exposure in the United States, or um, give the kind of in-depth experience that we're giving to Mustafa, or, or a combination? And it's always a struggle. And, and strategically, you know, to, to realize our mission as an organization, um, we grapple with that all the time. One of the questions that, oh, I'm sorry, there's a, someone raising a hand. Go ahead. Hi, Martha Libster from Chicago. I'm a professor of nursing, so I'm going to ask a caring science question, if you don't mind. Um, you mentioned that the students that you're inviting to the United States are uh, you're typically looking at, at the sciences. I'm wondering if you're including women students in, the, in nursing science. For example, caring science really does change the world. Some of our caring theorists have actually been um, um, you know, uh, over in Israel and so forth and have done great things. And so I'm just wondering if it's, if you've thought about that. I mean, you have a great representative here. All due respect, you do, I mean, you're doing great. I just wanted to ask that about young women. I, I'm so glad you asked that question, and, and I'm embarrassed to say as a woman that uh, we neglected to say that um, there, well, there aren't, um, 50% women who are attending um, our programs. Um, this is something else that's unique about Saving the Next Generation in Lebanon in that um, women are um, you know, also part of the mix and we don't discriminate. I'll say that, and, and when you look at the university students who are um, in Lebanon, it's um, a healthy mix. It's not quite 50%, but um, there are women students. And we have brought um, women students to the United States to study uh, over the summer and also um, you know, for four-year programs in engineering related. So I'd like um, to invite you to send me a nurse. So just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> Or come to Lebanon. <laughs> uh, thank you, though. Do you want to add to that? Yeah. Okay. Question over here, yes. Um, uh, two questions. The first, and I'm sorry if I missed it, Mustafa, where are you studying here in the States? Oh, at New York Institute of Technology. Oh, so here in the city, too. Then. Um, no, I'm like on the other campus in Long Island. Okay, but you're here in the city, and so that's wonderful. So, thank you. Um, now, the second question, this goes a little sideways in some ways, and I think maybe it's more directed towards Richard, but it's from the world where I come, and that is, um, have, um, is there any discussion about the, the, the sort of emerging concept of benefit corporations as a way to structure this and bring some of the accountability structures that you talked about to... I mean, it might take this work a step further. It's not just the, but is that at all part of the dialogue in, in 
your world or in, in this? Is there a potential there? I mean, so I was at, on, on Tuesday, we had a, a long discussion about whether the business and human rights uh, movement, um, and I say it that way because I'm not, movement's a funny word for me, but um, uh, should be looking at alternative corporate forms to influence human rights. Is there a similar discussion happening in your field? Let me say, I have some familiarity with the B Corporation. My children are uh, residents in Vermont. They're entrepreneurs in uh, one case uh, working for what is explicitly a B Corporation and in one case could, might it, could be but chose not to be because their values are the same. So it's just uh, by way of the explanation, I don't know if people know, but a B Corporation is a corporate entity which um, defines the beneficiaries not as specifically the stockholders, but the stakeholders. And uh, that's, it's in a legal context as well, uh, not because uh, you know, the, the reality is, I can assure you, as being someone in the private sector, that if you're not mindful of your stakeholders, the stockholders ultimately don't do well. So I think it's a, it may be a, a, a distinction uh, uh, without a difference depending on how the company is managed, but it does incorporate broader notions and, um, and, and ones that I think are very much in the social for, uh, forefront today. Um, and so I would say that it's a, it, it, as far as I know, this is a U.S. Uh, uh, legal construct. It's only in several states. I think it's Vermont, Maryland, and some others. But I, you, you probably have more knowledge. Yeah, no, I. it's it's actually moved pretty quickly in the states. It's over thirty now, is my understanding. Is it as many as thirty? Okay, well, I yeah. know it's spreading. So it's spreading, and, 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 and there's and it's spreading, and I'm sure that if you look at what's happening in our political discussions today, as to why yeah. there's a, is a large group of of, of of the polity that would support this. But it's, uh, I don't know uh, offhand, and perhaps uh, uh, stop it, but this gets a little esoteric, whether that concept has gone abroad. Uh, I mean, right. uh, you know, there, there are different corporate entity structures around, and I know Germany has uh, mm -hmm. AGs and, you know, different things. So it's a lot, it, this gets very technical it gets right. into, into, it, as, as to what the, how the legal structures are defined. But I think, what the B Corporation is notionally is sort of a blend of, the, of what I would call not the public and private sector, but the civil society and private mm -hmm. sector blurring, if right. you call the three legs of the stool. And it's a very interesting concept. I think it's yet to be proven how that will actually right. work out from a, an overall competitive standpoint. But I can tell you that my son takes huge pride in the fact that he is working in a B Corporation. So it certainly has... And uh, you know, encouraged his own uh, enthusiasm as a participant in that entity. Uh, this company is in the solar industry, but give you an example. Yeah. So their mission is is also consistent with it. What I'd like to do is turn to Nancy because she's the product of one of the foremost uh, academic programs in the United States that focuses on intercultural uh, issues uh, at, uh, at Wharton. I. Okay, this is a, I, ha I can make a plug for, for, my, for my graduate school, the Water Institute. That, yeah. um, so, we, uh, following on what Marv said, I have an MBA from Wharton and a master's degree in international relations. Um, this is a University of Pennsylvania based program. And um, my um, a region of expertise is uh, not Arabic in the Middle East or, or even French, but, but Spanish. And I've spent um, a lot of time in, in Cuba. But uh, anyway, to answer your question, um, saving the next generation is a traditional philanthropy. It's a 501c3 in the United States. And I don't see that changing anytime soon. However, it is my personal opinion that um, the world is going in that direction, most certainly um, to the area of impact investing. And I say that with several years um, of investment banking experience, followed by several more years in the not-for-profit arena. And now, finally, these two worlds are coming together. And um, from my perch, that is very exciting. And uh, the not-for-profits um, have been um, interested in this for a very long time because what we all need is resources, uh, because the programs, the quality programs that have demonstrated impacts are out there, um, but the resources to scale them have not been there. And now, finally, 
um, we're seeing the financial services sector and corporate America interested in just these entities, not just benefit corporations, but others. It's very, very exciting. Um, and it's nascent, so the, um, the structures that we all enjoy in the private sector, ratings agencies and um, standards of measurement, like uh, Rich is saying, profits and the bottom line, that, that's a very clean, neat, easily understandable organizing principle. When you talk about social impact and those type of measurements, it gets very tricky. And the terms aren't matched. So if you're looking for investment returns over a certain investment horizon, your social impact returns don't necessarily match those same terms. And education, what we're all about, saving the next generation, is a very good example of that. What type of social impacts are you going to measure in the context of saving the next generation that will be acceptable to um, a broader universe of investors or um, resource providers, let's say. That's a, a lot of mumbo jumbo and a long-winded answer, but for the time being, um, there's also a place for just straightforward philanthropy, and I think that's where Saving the Next Generation sits. One of the issues there is um, to what extent uh, you invite government involvement or not. And so, uh, you know, there's some, sometimes you can be at cross purposes if you have a government involvement where the government is not particularly uh, uh, seen as a friend in that particular uh, community. Um, Thus far, Saving Next Generation has uh, operated entirely on private funds. Yes. Um, yeah, so my name is Heather Schmidt. I'm an international recording artist. And um, I can speak to that um, specifically because I just finished up a, a project in Pakistan where uh, we didn't also use uh, government funds for that reason also because um, and um, what you're stating about um, this rather esoteric unmeasurables is um, something that kind of I've been struggling with myself is that, you know, we, we had what many have considered a very productive and very successful project and we weren't able to secure the next level of funding or um, take the project to the next level. So I have, um, you know, secured this, this very successful project in Pakistan which many have used as a case study and a successful, um, you know, anti-terrorism project, you know, um, anti-extremism and, uh, and haven't been able to um, move it to the next level because what is that measurable? And, um, and so I wondered how you have stated that and how, you know, what are the kind of ways that you kind of put that into a package and, and do you go, you know, entirely for private funding so that you can entirely stay away from, from you know, the the government fundings, um, because now we're at the position where we're being offered government funding and we just know that it's, it's number one, dangerous, and also, um, you know, it, it may be counterproductive. Rich may want to focus on this because um, we've, uh, one of our strategic partners is uh, he's on the board of that organization as well, and um, they are largely funded by government funds, so now you run into an issue if you're have a strategic partnership with an organization that is largely funded by the government and you're privately funded, how you work that out. Do you have oh, comments I see. on that, Rich? Yeah, well, actually, uh, World Learning is really two different entities in, in, uh, under one um, uh, overarching uh, uh, management. So the half of, of World Learning is uh, study abroad programs or uh, uh, study uh, uh, you know, a graduate institute in um, international relations, um, which is based in Brattleboro and in Washington. And th th this is uh, privately funded or through philanthropy. And mm -hmm. we are like, like any other um, uh, 501c3, uh, which is a, you know, a, a charitable entity, uh, tax deductible donations, we fund it and or people pay tuitions to go. There's this uh, study abroad at the high school level, ex experiment for international living. There's 
uh, the International Honors Group, which is a year-long program where you go around and, and study in four different countries on some themes such as climate change or world health, uh, to your point. Uh, there's the SIT um, uh, grad, uh, study abroad. Uh, my daughter spent uh, uh, six months in Cameroon, uh, and, and they go to you know uh, many of the lesser known places all over the world, uh, living with families in all cases. By the way, talk about cultural diplomacy, uh, and these be established lifelong relationships uh, with. And, and this is the real distinction. This is the family uh, uh, experiment. And then there's the SIT Graduate Institute. In, in Brattleboro in Washington, where you, you actually get a degree and it includes, uh, you know, international relations, but it also includes, it's typically trained for NGO um, uh, careers. We also have the International Exchange Program, uh, where we organize incoming students, we organize these programs abroad, and that is almost all USAID uh, or, or other government-funded programs. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, so many of the people who, frankly, are getting trained in our civil could end, end up in, 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 in that career path. Uh, so it's a blend, you know. But I think the, the, the key thing, and I'm, I'm mindful of your example because I think it's so real, the ultimate challenge, I mean, the, the, of, of any social uh, it, uh, um, entity, uh, you know, or effort is what are my, what's my outcomes? Yeah. The, the the input the, the the idealism the goal is 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 you know usually the driver. Yeah. But we've all got limited resources, and then the question is: so how do we define yeah. and 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 measure that outcome? And you have some control over that. Yeah. You can say, and you ideally you would in your mission statement: this is what we're trying to do. Okay. Uh, and, and then you develop your own set of metrics, which you would present to your funders, and, and hopefully they would concur. And, and the, but, but it is uh, in your interest as any uh, entity, the United Nations has the same issue. What are our metrics? What are we doing? Yeah. And, and Nancy made reference to the notion of impact investing. And let me just clarify what that means, because that's also an important nuance that's evolving. Uh, impact investing tend, looks at the outcomes of the investment as part of the return. So it includes okay. an economic return, but we said we will accept a lower economic return because we're achieving through this social. investment the social outcome that the, our goal is. So I make this distinction. There's also mm -hmm. in the investment world uh, the notion of uh, environmental social governance uh, investing, uh, PRI, SRI, there's so many acronyms it makes you dizzy. Yeah. In those instances, they may be certain principles, but they're not necessarily foregoing part of the economic return to achieve the social return. But impact yeah. investing, the nu nuance there is yes, we will accept a lower rate of return if I, by virtue of our investment, a lower economic rate of return if by virtue of that investment we it help to achieve this social goal that we have defined. And, and, and that mm -hmm. might be a source of funding for you to find those entities who share that vision in, in you know, who are, who are uh, providers of funding. The same goal. Mm -hmm. I, I, just, I just want to emphasize what Rich said. This is all, you know, yet, yet to be written and, and organized. Uh, so it really, de it's so specific. It depends on your particular mission and the goals that you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I want to um, differ a little bit with what Rich said about impact investing. Um, there have been some studies that have shown that in certain cases, um, you can have uh, social impact and goals alongside financial um, goals that are um, market rate uh, or, or better, sometimes worse. But that, again, is very individual. It's what you're willing to accept. So, um, you know, if uh, you're struggling with whether or not to accept government funds, it depends with what the constraints are around those government funds. Will it help you achieve your goals long term or will it... Um, in, in, impinge those long-term goals. And I say long-term because um, short-term it might be solving a problem, but you might run into problems down the road. So you have to be very careful. Oh, yes, yes, you do have to be careful for sure. Um, I just had a quick follow-up um, question. Did you have, um, you know, with these progressive initiatives, um, often, certainly in my case, there are 
uh, security issues um, that are, are coming right along with it, and I'm, that I'm sure that may have been in your case. Were there things that happened along the way, and can you speak to um, how you dealt with how you dealt with them. It's an interesting thing that you're focusing on that question because I was just going to make a cut. Oh, yeah. It's <laughs> actually going to turn to Mustafa. And that is that um, uh, since these areas where these kids are coming from that are part of our program come from uh, uh, circumstances where uh, extremism pervades, uh, Mustafa, what does it feel like when you're approached or how, you, how your family was approached uh, uh, and you were a candidate to join SNG, uh, are there any um, uh, means of, of uh, addressing any fears that one might have? Is, is fear uh, a consideration as in joining SNG, which is really the counterpoint to the extremist organization? Tell us a little about how that works, both from your parents' standpoint and from your standpoint. Okay. So, um, like, what SNG is doing right now is, like, attacking the roots of extremism. So, if, like, when, like, so, like, these extremists have, like, to do something against that. So, um, taking students, like, this, taking the young people from, like, between the hands of these people, like, it will um, it will affect them in a bad in a bad way, like and like from their point of view. So um, after like peop um, the young people go and um, meet SNG and like um, follow SNG, like and um, like I don't know how to say it, but they start. Um, threatening people in order not to advance in their future, in order to stay with them, and um, mo mo there's like there's a lot of activists in Lebanon, like um, college student activists, that are getting threatened right now. Um, if you know um, Amir, if you met him, if you met him like on Facebook or something. Um, so they are getting a lot of threats, and um, yeah, like it's it's actually hard to um, to f like face all these threats. Like even if it was mentally, it's, it's so hard. So Mustafa, then you know, with all the fear factor as large as it is, and very understandably so, um, what finally causes a family and a and a child? to take that next step and join an organization and become a part of this kind of a movement, if you will. Uh, what, is it, what is the motivation? What is, it, uh, what is it the factor that uh, finally releases you, you might say, or causes you to have the courage to take that next step? Like, what happened with my family is that, okay, we, wanna, we, want, we want to move on, you know? So, like, if you look at Lebanon for the past 20, 30 years, years it's just repeating itself. Same leaders, same um, same strategy, same political strategy, which is going nowhere. You know, um, so like we want the Lebanon that we we know. Like in 1960s, it was known as Lebanon was known as the Switzerland of the Middle East. So we want this back. You know, like I love Lebanon. And I want to be in this kind of place, you know? So um, that's, that's like the main reason why families would, would go this way, you know? Yeah. I, I, in addition, um, success breeds success. So the first few families um, faced um, a, a lot of pressure um, not to join, uh, especially for the younger program, the, the programs for the younger kids. It was the families that were harassed a little bit. Um, but as soon as more families saw what was happening and began to participate, um, there was less pressure. So now you have, you know, um, 
large groups of kids from entire villages who are participating and coming back and saying, I love this program, and I met so-and-so, and she's a Sunni, and I never knew that, and I'm a Shia, and it doesn't matter. And um, then they get left alone. So um, if we can grow these programs in certain areas, uh, that makes it easier. And, and they are... It's multi-beneficial. They have education where they can provide money for their family, and also maybe they have a, a, a support system for other graduates that they can turn to in these times of pressure where they can support each other. You can, you know, kind of support your own other graduates who are, you know, coming back to a system that has a, has a real backlash, and, but it, it grows, and, and as people see that it's, you know, not... Um, threatening they can. Exactly. The more students like Mustafa who graduate with a degree in engineering and go back and have good jobs, the, yeah. it just, um, you know, is a virtuous cycle. We're approaching um, the one hour point and I promised Mark that uh, we were going to take no longer than an hour with this, what we consider to be, at least I consider to be, most interesting exchange. Um, we can take maybe one last question for if anyone is save, was saving it up and if not, uh, well, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, uh, to talk about what we obviously feel very strongly about, uh, fighting extremism, promoting mutual understanding. And uh, I know that's why you're here in the larger sense. And so congratulations to you and my thanks for pursuing these aims uh, in each of your respective uh, domiciles. Thank you.